Breath of Life presents Relentless Pursuit with Pastor Walter L. Pearson, Jr. I'm going to ask that we turn to the book of Judges. The book of Judges, chapter 4. It is my joy to be at my alma mater, to be at Oakwood College, the place that helped to make me whatever good I am. And I thank the president of this institution and the chaplaincy department and Dr. Blue and all of those who were so kind. I thank you for allowing me to come back home. It is my joy to be here. Judges chapter 4, I only need one verse which will introduce our subject for tonight, our title for tonight. Judges chapter 4, and I'm going to read in your hearing verse 21. Then Yael, Heber's wife, took a nail of the tent and took a hammer in her hand and went softly unto him and smote the nail into his temples and fastened it to the ground for he was fast asleep and weary so he died i've entitled my sermon for tonight be careful where you sleep <laughs> would you pray with me father in heaven all that i have and all that i am i place again into your hands i ask only that when I get too far, you'll pull me back. When I don't run fast enough, you'll push me along. For my only desire in this place is to please God. Let Jesus come and speak. Let my voice be muffled so that his might be heard. Empower me with the power of the Holy Spirit. And I pray that the words that are transmitted I'm so grateful that you allow me to use my personality, but don't let it get in your way and speak to our hearts tonight. In the name of Jesus, let everyone say, Amen. The Bible says there came a time when Israel, having occupied the land of promise, we say it so blithely, promised land, that we forget that God promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, I will give you a land that flows with milk and honey. These days, the health people have discovered that both milk and honey may be problems for us. But we know what that means. It was a rich land. So rich, says one scholar, that if you dropped a seed on the ground without tilling it, you would come back and find something growing. God gave that land to his people. And now we find them in this moment occupying the land under duress. You got it, but you can't enjoy it. There is nothing worse than having a gift that cannot be all that it's intended to be. So the children of God are in Canaan, but now there is a king of Canaan who had represented a people conquered by the predecessors of God's children and yet treated perhaps too kindly by their forebears. So now somebody who should have been conquered rises up again to trouble Israel in the very land that God has given to them. It's a terrible situation. So the people go to get water. And in those places where they went to get water, somebody would come and perhaps someone would be killed. They would be troubled, their possessions taken from them. It was a terrible situation. People had to leave the populous places, those places where they would ordinarily go. They could not go because these people under the, under the instruction of Yabin and his general Sisera would find soldiers coming to give them trouble. They had to go to tiny places. They had to go to the walled cities. They could not enjoy the very land that was their gift, that was their birthright. Something had to happen. 
I don't know about you, but I've discovered that God may not be on my time schedule, but he comes on time. If you ever find somebody doubting that God will move, you must remind them that all the way through this book, there are so many occasions where people said, he's not going to do anything. He's not going to help us. I've discovered that God shows who he is by stepping in when you think he won't. In fact, when you say that it's impossible to make a change, that's when God proves his divinity because he accomplishes the impossible. So when all of the people have given up, in fact, when the men of the land, brethren, I don't want to do this, but it's in the word. When the men of the land had given up, and I'll tell you why they'd given up. I, I want to be fair to the men. The men had no weapons. When you searched among them, one scholar suggests that there were 40,000 of them, but not one sword or spear among them. And they knew that on the other side, this Yabin and his general Sisera had 900 iron chariots. These iron chariots were not ordinary. They had appended to their axles scythe like swords that turned with the axles. And what those soldiers would do is that they would get into their iron chariots and plow through footmen that came to fight them. And when they went through, those swords would cut people down and kill them without any effort on the part of the one who drove the chariot. So think about it. Here are God's children in their own land, but now they've got a general, and this general has 900 iron chariots with swords on the axles, and they know we can't go up against them because they have more power than we do. So the men got quiet. The men ceased to make any noise. I don't know about you, but that is not a situation that is comfortable for me. I believe that men ought to make man noises. Not every community is the same, but masculinity has a way of evincing itself. There's a way a man walks. It's not always the same, but it says the same thing. A man ought to walk in a certain way. When he talks, there ought to be a little rumble in his voice. It doesn't have to be a low voice, but there ought to be some testosterone down there somewhere. Well, that makes it rumble. The men of Israel had started to talk in high-pitched voices. Because they didn't want to be discerned. They thought about the iron chariots and said, Hey, how you doing? I understand them, don't you? Well, just when they thought that there was no help, God chose a leader who was not typical. It was not a man because the man was one who might be in trouble. So God said, let me show you something that I can do. He chose a woman to stand in the gap. This woman's name was Deborah. She became the judge for that moment. She was not a judge in so much as she was always settling disputes, but when the people would come to meet with Deborah, she would remind them of how powerful their God was. In fact, fact when the men came, I'm sure they had some issues for a moment about gender because that's just the way we are. But if God is with somebody, it doesn't make any difference whether they are male or female. It's whether they've got God with them. So finally, the men rose up and said, let's go down and meet with Deborah. She had her office either in a house, the scholars are led to believe, that was under a palm tree, or maybe she was out in the open places with a palm tree. But when you went down to sit with Deborah, if you were a man, she would start talking something in your presence. She'd say, what's going on? Well, uh, Judge Deborah, you... you you know, I, 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 I don't know who's listening. So no, 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 don't worry about who's listening. What's going on? Is there anything happening? Is there something planned? Well, you know, uh, you may not understand, Deborah, because you're a woman. 
and, and, and you know, they may not attack you like they'll attack us, but we got to remember those iron chariots. She says, sir, if you don't mind, you got to remember that you got a God who's more powerful than anybody's iron chariot. So yeah, I, you know, I understand what you're saying. In theory. <laughs> but you know, Sister would roll up in here with those iron chariots and it'd be something altogether different. I mean, they may let you go, but they're going to get us. But do you remember that there have been situations like that all the way through our history? Do you remember that it is that God who gave us this land? Do you think he gave it to us to have us persecuted in it? It's time that the brethren get together. I don't want to tell you what to do. I know that's a tender issue. But get the brethren together. Have a little small group meeting. Somebody ought to talk about how powerful God is. Because I don't know about you, but I believe God can handle Sisera. I believe God can handle Yebi. God took him out one time and his people, he can take him out again. God can do anything. Finally, they ran into a, a brother who was not typical. His name was Barak. Uh, I do not want to, well, let me make a disclaimer. I believe that when you find a man who has courage, it shows some way. I don't want to say that every man with courage, you know, walks. Because uh, some neighborhoods are different, and some of you will go out and get hurt because you don't see anybody walking like this. And uh, you'll think you're safe. Well, not every man with courage walks like that, but in the place where I was born, a man had a little rhythm when he had courage. <laughs> he did not walk in an ordinary way so forgive me if I believe that when I see Barak he's not you know cowering <laughs> when you see Barak you say how you doing <laughs> Barak you heard about the situation with the iron chariots heard about it <laughs> what do you think about it don't want to discuss it <laughs> Well, I heard you ain't all that upset about the iron chariots. Not upset. Don't want to talk about it. Because when you're about action, you don't need to be about too many words. <laughs> Down under Deborah's palm tree, God began to speak. God said, Deborah, call Barak. Tell him that I want him to assemble an army. Think about it. Let's have a reality check. No weapons, no swords, no spears. But if God says you can be an army, you can be an army. You may have nothing but faith, but I tell you that faith is a weapon. Obedience is a weapon. Call Barak and tell him when he gets here. When Barak shows up with his little walk, tell him that I told you to tell him. Let's get an army together. Give me 10,000. That's all I need. <laughs> uh, yeah, but uh, most people know that the 900 iron chariots have more men with them. Well, God does not need to equal numbers. One plus God is a majority. I could tell you stories if we had time. There, there are people who will come against you not understanding that if God be for you, who can be against you? And so Deborah calls Barak and says, uh, I want you to get to your tribe. And with only those two little tribes, Naphtali and Zebulun, get 10,000 men and I'll, I'll tell you what to do. He said, wait a minute, before we get too far with this, let's not waste each other's time. I do, from time to time, find the way to go and accomplish certain things with a small group of dedicated believers. But it sounds like you're doing something on a larger scale now. Uh, if you're going to do that, then what I need from you, Deborah, is to represent a call from God to action. I don't have that. I am a, a soldier, but I don't have the imprimatur that you have. I don't carry with me the power of God in my signature. But you, Deborah, represent God. So if you say 
that I can call 10,000 men. Then I will call them because you said God commanded it. And God's command will be enough. She said, then let it be done. You say, well, you just said a word. Okay. Now, what do we do after that? She said, I'm going to talk to God. And you got to listen to this because there's somebody here right now worried about an enemy of yours. You've been making too many phone calls, having too many discussions, trying to discover how to overcome your enemy. When the fact is that if you have an enemy and you are on God's side, then your enemy is God's enemy. And God says, vengeance is mine. So if you know that you're on God's side, you can stop all of that strategic planning about your enemies. Because if they're God's enemies, he's got a plan and it's always strategic. So he said, how do we do it? She said, well, God is going to bring your enemy to you. <laughs> well, you focus slow. Because what I just said is that you don't have to find your enemies. God will put you in a superior position and then bring your enemies to you. Said, well, how does that work? She said, well, here's how it's going to go. You take the 10,000 men to Mount Tabor. You will have an elevated position so that you will look down on your enemies. Well, Deborah, the problem with that is that I don't know any general who would bring his army into that inferior position. I say, well, then you don't know God. Because God can make your enemies come to a servile position in relationship to where you are. That's what God does. So take them to Mount Tabor, and when you get there, you don't have to worry because God will cause Yabin and Sisera to bring their whole army underneath you at the base of the mount. She said, here's the thing. Are you ready to do it? He said, well, Deborah, I'm ready to do it, but I can't go without you. Now, this is a good spot in this sermon. Because there are too many places, even in churches, where men and women don't understand how to work together. There are too many men worried about women taking over. Too many men worried about, you know, what's going to happen. Too, too much tension between the genders. If God is in there somewhere, then regardless of your gender, if you are connected with him, God makes you a place. I did study for a sermon long ago, and I discovered that the magnetic power of the sun keeps every other celestial body in the right place. So you don't have to worry about anybody taking your place in Christ. If the S-U-N, which has less power than the S-O-N, if the sun puts you in your place, nobody can take your place. The gravitational force of the S-U-N puts all of those celestial bodies in their place and locks them there. They may orbit but they orbit where the sun says orbit. And I tell you that if you are in Christ, you may move around, but you'll move where Jesus says move, and there are no collisions in Christ. The only celestial bodies that shoot around messing up are shooting stars, and they burn out in their own heat. So if somebody keeps bouncing in your face out of place, just let them keep on burning, and they'll burn themselves out. So, so, Barack, you don't know, worry about all that stuff. Let me just tell you what you've got to do. But if you need me to come, you will accomplish your goal, but you won't get credit for it. The credit will go to a woman. Let's pause here a moment. It's time for another reality check. The reason why churches can't get things done is because everybody's worried about credit. Who's going to get the plaque? Who's going to get the flowers? Who's going to get the recognition? I wish we could stop for 10 minutes worrying about who's going to get the credit and get something done in the name of Jesus. 
Barack says, I don't care who gets the credit. What I need you for, Deborah, I need you to represent Jesus. I need you to represent the head. Brothers, you got to listen. may hurt you, but you need to hear it. You, Deborah, will be the head. I'm going to be the hand. Some brother has already kicked in his television set. I, he will not see the end of my sermon. But I'll tell you this. If God designates a woman to be head, let her be head. If God designates a brother to be hand, let him be hand. If God says it, it'll fly. So Barack says, you come go with me. And she says, well, I will. Now think about it. A woman has no place in battle, but uh, no, listen to me, pastors, no religious leader should, should send anyone to a place that they are not willing to go themselves. Well, I even got quiet in the room on that. She says, let's go. He said, you know, go get the credit. He said, I worry about credit. Let's get it done. Now, Deborah with Barak and 10,000 soldiers began to march to Mount Tabor. As marching to Mount Tabor, they passed by a place inhabited by the Kenites. Kenites are some interesting people. They are descendants of Jethro, the father-in-law of Moses, people who know the true God. But they are also in a friendly relationship with Yabin. So they have a diplomatic relationship that we could describe as detente. So the Kenites love the true God, but they get along with these Canaanites. And as Barak and Deborah march to Mount Tabor, there is a Kenite who sees what's going on. Heba. And I'm not trying to say there was gossip back in there. I, I'm not trying to say that, but I'll break it down for you. Here's what happened. When Heber saw uh, Deborah and Barak with 10,000 soldiers, he said, you know, I wonder if Sisera knows about this. So he just happened to be near Sisera. Sisera, uh, I wouldn't necessarily want you to remember who told you this. But the other day I saw something real strange. You know, normally since you guys have been kind of oppressing everybody, you can hardly find Israelites in public. Well, guess what I saw the other day? I saw 10,000 Israelites marching up to the top of Mount Tabor. I, I want you to remember what I said, but don't tell anybody who told you. I said, you sure you saw that? I saw it with these eyes. I don't know if it means anything to you, but I just thought I'd pass it along for what it's worth. Well, Cicero says, okay then. So these guys have developed a backbone. <laughs> They're going to go and march somewhere. So I tell you what let's do. It's time to roll out the iron chariots. They go and, and get them glistening as much as iron can. They pull together all of their armaments. They pull together their men and materiel and say, if they can mount, march to Mount Tabor, then we will go to accompany them, for they must be up to some mischief. And these soldiers with their powerful chariots roll on the same path and end up at the base of Mount Tabor and I'm telling you now you got to see this because if God is in your life if you have a connection with God you will have something like this happen for you so now Deborah and Barak with 10,000 soldiers look down at the base of the mountain and Barak says to Deborah you said it's gonna happen didn't you I'm not saying I didn't believe you but I'm gonna tell you something that's some hard stuff to believe. We up here and they down there. I thought we could never beat them. Here we are high and they are low. This is amazing. 
what do you think we ought to do next? She said, you read, what do we do next? We're going down this mountain and take out our enemy. God will be for us. In fact, there came a moment, Josephus said, when fear went through the 10,000, when fear even tugged at Barak, and he started to think, maybe I should go and find a hiding place up here. But Deborah said to him, hey, 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 you know who's with us? Didn't I tell you to go to the mountain and we're up here? Yeah. Didn't I tell you I was going to draw by God's power our enemy to us? Yeah. Didn't it happen just like God promised? Yeah. Well, that same God who drew them to us says, go down and get them. <laughs> Incidentally, there are some times in your life when you just got to trust God. <laughs> just got to do what he says. And so Barak pulls together his courage and he makes the command and they begin to march with no weapons down to face the iron chariots. Join us next time as Pastor Pearson's message continues. With 10,000 soldiers look down at the base of the mountain and Barak says to Deborah, you said it's going to happen, didn't you? I'm not saying I didn't believe you, but I'm going to tell you something. That's some hard stuff to believe. We up here, and they're down there. I thought we could never beat them. Here we are high, and they are low. This is amazing. What do you think we ought to do next? She said, you read, what do we do next? We're going down this mountain and take out our enemy. God will be for us. In fact, there came a moment, Josephus said, when fear went through the 10,000, when fear even tugged at Barak, and he started to think, maybe I should go and find a hiding place up here. But Deborah said to him, hey, 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 you know who's with us? Didn't I tell you to go to the mountain and we're up here? Yeah. Didn't I tell you I was going to draw by God's power our enemy to us? Yeah. Didn't it happen just like God promised? Yeah. Well, that same God who drew them to us says, go down and get them. <laughs> Incidentally, there are some times in your life when you just got to trust God. <laughs> just got to do what he says. And so Barak pulls together his courage and he makes the command. And they begin to march with no weapons down to face the iron chariots. You know, you got to have something happening with God to do that kind of thing. It doesn't make sense otherwise. But as they begin to march down in full force, and let me tell you something, when you once obey God, the act of obeying him gives you strength to obey him more. When Joshua marched around Jericho, one of my favorite writers says, as they heard themselves hitting the ground together with their feet, the sound of their feet in unison gave them a cadence that built up their confidence. If you do what God says, that obedience breeds more power. So as they began to run down, I, I imagine that Cicero was trying to figure out what in the world is going on. Come here a minute. Are they coming down that mountain? Uh, yeah, that's what they're doing. Are they coming down fast? Yes. Do they look like they got a plan? Yes. Got any idea what they got in mind? I think they're about to take us out. Well then, let's go get them. Now, believe Josephus for just a moment. Josephus says that at that moment, the stars fought against them. Well, here's how he explains it. He says that there came instantaneously a hailstorm. Well, you can look, look in Judges chapter 5 and verse 20. The Bible says the stars fought. And incidentally, if God be for you, God can command the stars to be on your side. And I don't know about you, but I, I believe that if the stars will fight with you, what will the moon do? 
And would the son dare to join in on the plan? I don't know. You may not have enough imagination to go where I'm going. But I'm telling you that if you are with God, there is a resonance in the whole universe that begins to work on your behalf. So when they looked at those ill-equipped soldiers coming down that mountain, they decided, let's go and get them. But at that moment, there came a hailstorm, says Josephus. They were discomfited, says the Bible. One scholar says that in that very place, the earth is so unstable that after about 30 minutes of moisture, it gives way so that it will barely hold a foot standing on it, much less the wheel of an iron chariot. Can you imagine if everybody is right? Could it be that the hailstorm came? Could it be that the stars fought against them? Could it be that the ground gave way and the chariots wouldn't move? Could it be that God rained ice into the faces of this army so that they could no longer see? Could it be that God snatched their confidence? Could it be that he multiplied their paranoia exponentially so that while they stood erect in their iron chariots, they began to wonder, who's after me? And they turned and tried to run. But as they were about to run, people with no weapons came and began to beat them. They have only their hands, but if the Lord is in your hand, <laughs> what a mighty weapon it becomes. If the Lord is in the heart of a person, if God has deranged your mind, then people began to fight each other. It wouldn't be the first time in the Word of God when people began to turn on each other. Finally, the order comes, go get every one of them. How can you do it with no weapon? You can do it because God said so. You forgive me, I am insane in some situations because I'm crazy enough to believe that if God says it, you ought to obey what God says. There are too many people now doing feasibility studies on what God says. I don't know what university let you in. I know less about whatever university let you out. But if you came out thinking that you knew more than God, you have, you ought to re rethink your whole educational process. Go back and get your money back. Because they didn't help you. They messed your brain up. Somewhere along the way, you should have learned that if God says it, you must move on it. And all of a sudden, the whole army of Sisera is gone. Sisera is out of his iron chariot. And, out of, you know, I thank God for this imagination. I, I believe that uh, God does things for preachers who try their best to study. I, I try to gather all the facts. I don't want my... In, information to be so scanty that my imagination can't work. I want to inform my imagination, then take it down to the river to be baptized again, and, and then ask God to begin to move with it and make it accomplish things. So I am there. I'm looking at the base of Mount Tabor, and I see nothing but abandoned chariots. But there's one figure in the mist. The hailstorm has abated. There's a strange fog. But here comes somebody, and it looks like Sisera. He's looking to see where those crazy Israelites went trying to find a place where he doesn't encounter them anymore. And he runs and he thinks, I'll go to the camp of the Kenites. And he runs and he gets there and he says, where is Heber's tent? I don't know where his home, but I want to go there. And he arrives at Heber's tent and Heber is not there. But his wife is there, Yael. And he goes says, Yael, you know me? Sorry, I, I don't know you, sir, but come in.
You look tired. Are you thirsty? Yes, I'm, th I'm thirsty. Would you like something to drink? Yes. Well, I could give you water. Oh, I got some milk over here. You know, sometimes a little milk will calm you down. <laughs> well, I don't know where you are now. Some of you have no imagination, so you are completely lost. <laughs> Listen to Yael. You know, we, we, we're good neighbors. I know you're not one of our people, but it's okay. We love everybody. We are children of the Most High God. So what I was thinking, sir, you seem real tired. I got a little place over there in the corner. I'll get you some milk for you to drink. You want me to warm it up a little bit? One scholar says that Yael may have even had a crust of bread somewhere. And, and in some communities, there are strange potions that are made with something called corn bread. <laughs> and at your store, if it's a well-equipped store, you may even find butter, milk. My grandmother used to imbibe. She would get a crust of bread and, and fast asleep she would be before long. And I can see, yes, give me a little bit of that. She said, tell you what, why don't you have a little something to drink? Want a little piece of that? You can have that too. I got a little cover. Let me put this cover over you. You okay? He said, now, if, if somebody comes and asks, asks if I'm in here, tell them I'm in here. He said, well, don't worry about that. You're feeling all right. You're comfortable? Let me put this over you. Keep you warm. Don't want you to get cold. You can get a chill when you sleep. <laughs> she covers him up. Now, now, here is where I had to do some work. What made that woman change from the welcoming child of God to a woman who had the ability to cause mortal danger. And here is what I believe. I believe that God was always in this picture. When the children of God had become idolatrous for 20 years, after Ahab died, they, they had nobody to keep them in check, so they became idolaters. And when you pull away from God, you also pull yourself away from his special protection. People don't understand that when you cast God out of your life, you also cast away your best protection. I know that God is good to people who are evil and people who are good. The rain falls on the just and the unjust. But there are some gifts that the unjust cannot have from God. There is a special relationship that God has with certain people, and that special relationship includes special protection. I believe that God's people, after they had gotten their land, forgot how they got over. There are too many people who forget what God has done. There are people who, who get stuff and get infatuated with stuff. And you forget how you got it. I have met people who matriculated at wonderful institutions of higher learning and, and they call me as their pastor from time to time when they are about to defend their thesis you should hear them they are the quintessence of humility pastor tomorrow i've got to defend my thesis my dissertation is on the line pastor and i've done everything i can i don't want you to think i'm lazy or i don't want you to think that i haven't used my brain i've done the best i could but this thing has gigantic holes in it pastor and i want you to pray that god will give me the ability to defend it would you pray with me now would i pray with them i said i feel better i said well tell me how it came out and it's amazing 
the difference in the person who called before graduation and the person who calls after. Remember the one before? Master, please, I did done everything I could. And then when they remember to call me back, Pastor, how are you? <laughs> Don't know whether you heard. I'm doctor now. <laughs> see, see, I'm not mad at you. I'm glad you're doctor. But you need to remember that one who called me on the phone before you graduated. Because <laughs> you ought to keep a little bit of that after your doctor. Are you still with me? Because you will need that again. Too many people who get the house. You know, I don't know how you got the house. Your credit was really in bad shape. You had blemishes everywhere. And those, those people who check your credit before you buy a house are merciless. They go way, way, way back. And they check everything, don't they? And they call you and tell you about it. You would think that they would have mercy and not bring it up. But, uh, uh, eight years ago, you had a late payment. Yes. You don't remember it? I have it right here. I can, t I can tell you the month. What about that car? Lord, if you give me a nice car, I will take people from the streets. I will drive them to worship. It doesn't make any difference what they look like, how well dressed they are. I will, I will cause them to get in my car and I will take them to your house. And there we will glorify your name together. And they put you in that little room where they turn off the air conditioner and, and they're listening to you in there and you're wondering what's going on and you and your wife are bowed together in prayer but you don't want to close your eyes because you want to seem confident and they finally come back and say your credit is approved you don't want to shout you don't want to scream because that will make them think that you didn't know you were going to get the credit. <laughs> and then you drive away and every piece of glass becomes a mirror pretty good in here, don't I? And you forget how you got what you have. Here's what I want to say to you. When you have a victory, remember that it was not you who chased God. It was God who chased you. The children of Israel had gone. They had no hope, but finally their enemies were so oppressive that somebody said, why don't we call Jesus? Well, it was God then, but I'll tell you in a few hours that it was always Christ. And why don't we turn back to God? And it was then when God says, let me give them Deborah. It was then when God said, let me call for them Barak. It was then when God said, let me get them ten thousand soldiers. It was then when God said, let me put them in a superior position. It was then when God said, let me draw their enemies to them. It was then when God sent down a hailstorm and their enemies were destroyed, not by their might, not by their power, but by the power of God. Amen. And I wanted to remind some of us who allow strange ladies or strange gentlemen to make us comfortable in otherwise uncomfortable places. Come on in. You've never been there before, but there you go. Where should I? Right over there. You want something to drink? Have a little something to eat. Why don't I put this over you? Feel all right? 
I believe that it was God who cannot be outrun, the same God who blessed his people now watches as Sisera tries to run away without being caught. And I believe that it was God who spoke to Yael, a woman who was at first very welcoming. I believe that God revealed to her who it was asleep on her tent floor. I believe it was God that gave her the skill. Think about it. I've worked my way all the way through it. If you're going to nail a person's temples to the ground, you cannot practice by putting the nail on them. So you, you, you didn't work your way to all the way through that because you had it down there, didn't you? Let me see. Oh, you got. She went outside and got one of those metal tent stakes, and but she can't touch him because if she touches him, in fact, she can't make a noise. She's got to get the nail here. Mm -hmm. In fact, this can't be her first time hitting one of those stakes. <laughs> Just right. One scholar says. Sisera's mind was so full of this world that he would not obey God. Do you doubt that God tried to stop Sisera somewhere along the way? Do you doubt that God said, don't turn your iron chariots against my people? Do you doubt that God tried to show mercy to this general who was only about himself? Do you that somewhere after the hailstorm, God had not whispered in his ear, you're wrong, Sisera. But Sisera determined that he would be for himself and for his king. He would hear no other voice. And I tell you that when you get to the place where you are beyond what you think is the reach of God, you must understand that God's arm is longer than you imagine. So now a woman with no evil thought has an impulse that does not come, the scholars believe, from a satanic origin, but a man who is determined to do wrong is now put in the place where God always puts his enemies. And God empowers a woman to pick up a stake and to pick up a hammer, to suspend it in midair, and then with one heavy blow oh, to push it through his temples and nail him to the earth that he loves so much. Since his mind will not accept heavenly thoughts, now his mind is nailed to the earth where his thoughts have emanated from. And God shows that he cannot be outrun. Here is what I want to say to you tonight. There are some people who have been in the wrong place, welcomed by a stranger. Your purpose was not holy. I've talked to people who've been in that situation. I talked to a man whose story I cannot tell completely, but it is an absolutely true story. A man who told me that he was in the wrong place at the wrong time for the wrong reason, and then he heard the strange click of a firearm close to his ear. He said, Pastor, I don't know how I could have not heard the car drive up. I don't know how I could have not heard the door open. I don't know how I could have missed all of those things, but all of a sudden I found myself in a situation that was untenable. And he said, at that moment I had the nerve to call on God for mercy. And here's what I want to tell you. It's amazing how the God who cannot be outrun sometimes dispenses mercy where I would not give it. Where you would not give it. If you were God, this auditorium would be at least half empty tonight because there's some things you wouldn't put up with. But God is so intent on bringing us back to him that there are times even when we are caught, he dispenses mercy 
It does not always have to be a nail through the temples. For God only looks for just enough information to dispense mercy instead of justice. And I want to say finally that while some have been in wrong places asleep, you ought not just be careful where you sleep, but how you sleep. There are people who go to sleep with unconfessed sin. While you are awake, you can talk to God. While you are awake, there are people in this room who know that God has more mercy than you could ever imagine but you've got to deal with them while you're conscious. And yet there are many of us who go to sleep every night while things are not right with God. And I tell you, you must not only be careful where you sleep, but how you sleep. And if you've come to the place in your life where your sins stand out but have not been confessed, remember that God is both just and merciful. You cannot outrun him. At the moment that you think you're out of his reach, you are not. But his hand dispenses justice for those who will take nothing else, and mercy for anyone who is willing to allow him to make a change in your life. My admonition to you tonight, be careful where you sleep, be careful how you sleep, and remember that you cannot get beyond the hand of God. God bless you is my prayer. Thanks for watching. Join us next time for more Breath of Life with Walter L. Pearson. Walter Pearson believes that Jesus Christ is the answer to every problem you face.